Ken, hi, thank you so much for making the time. It's great to speak to you. I know that you've spent quite a lot of your career studying the science around snowflakes and you've been creating them in the laboratory and photographing them. So what is it about them that makes them so fascinating for you? Well, I got into this a long time ago, like 25 years ago, and, and no particular reason. I just started reading about the subject and I found there was a lot of mystery about how snowflakes uh, grew and why they have the shapes they have. Some temperatures you get columns and some temperatures you get plates and people didn't really understand that. And that just seemed crazy. You know, it's like these things fall out of the sky. We ought to know how they work. Could you just clear up what is the difference between a snowflake and a snow crystal? So a snow crystal is a very specific thing. That's a single crystal of ice. But when you go outside into a snowfall, you sometimes see these uh, puff balls falling. That's just a bunch of individual snow crystals that have stuck together. And those are called snowflakes. What are the perfect conditions for snowfall in the natural world? And do we get pure snow crystals falling out of the sky ever? Oh, you definitely get uh, snow crystals all the time. And those are the, you know, the six fold symmetrical stars, for example. The canonical Christmas snowflake is a nearly perfect snow crystal. And they, and they happen all the time, but they are somewhat rare uh, in the sense that if you go out looking for a really nice, uh, beautiful, stellar snow crystal, those are hard to find. Those are, those are the money shots as a, as a snowflake photographer. And uh, those only fall under fairly precise conditions. And the temperature needs to be right around minus 14 Celsius, give or take a couple of degrees. So if you want to see a lot of nice snow crystals, uh, that's a cold climate. And so when I'm out photographing snowflakes, I'm usually looking for places on the edge of civilization because I've discovered that around minus 15 is where people uh, are willing to live, but reluctantly. Can you talk us through the physics of how a snowflake is actually formed? Really nice stellar crystals that you think about when you think snowflake, those only fall under really precise conditions. And the temperature needs to be right around minus 14 Celsius, give or take a couple of degrees. When a single water droplet freezes, then it turns into ice and starts to grow. Mm. But not all the droplets freeze, and it grows by absorbing water vapor. And that water vapor is supplied by the droplets. And so it takes like 100,000 droplets to form one large snow crystal. And for the water molecule, it has um, a six-fold symmetry. And so as it grows further, the, you've got a little hexagonal plate. And the corners of the plate, they stick out a little further. And so as it gets bigger, those those tips will grow faster and then it will sprout branches. And as it grows, it becomes sort of a dendritic shape. Uh, you know, there's a lot of physics all happening at once. I know that you've grown snow crystals before from scratch in the lab. Take us kind of through that process. How does that differ from how they would form in the real world? They start with a, a large chamber that's just full of air and I evaporate some uh, water into the air. The air becomes super saturated, so the humidity is above 100%. And then I have a, a little high pressure thing that produces a sharp region of cold, uh, and that will nucleate crystals. So they start as droplets and very quickly turn into uh, ice, and they will grow while they're floating around in this chamber by the millions, because I'm just making this thing uh, nucleate like crystals like crazy. And those are little tiny, by tiny, I mean, 20, 30 microns, so slightly smaller than the size of a hair. And those are floating around in the air. And, uh, and now I want to make a, a larger crystal. So I just take some of those, some of that air, which the crystal is just floating in the air, and I move it into a second chamber. And I just let some crystals fall onto a, a glass substrate. And uh, then I just slowly blow uh, human air on top of it and I can change the temperature of the substrate. So that changes the temperature of the crystal. And I can also change the humidity of the air I'm blowing down. So I can grow it slowly or quickly. 
at different temperatures. And that's how I can sort of control the growth. So I can make, uh, I call them designer snowflakes. It takes maybe 45 minutes to make one. And, uh, and I can sort of watch it grow during that time. And, and since I understand a little about the physics, I can change the growth. I can sort of say, well, I want branches now. I want plates now. And so I just change the, the conditions because it's all under control. And so, uh, uh, so I can make really kind of very nice looking snowflakes. So you hold the Guinness World Record for the largest snow crystal. And I gather that there was a previous record for the largest snowflake. Take me through the, the process of growing your giant snow crystal um, and whether or not you think that that snowflake record is reliable. <laughs> well, okay, so I, I've done a lot of snowflake photography and my favorite place is up in northern Ontario in a little town called Cochrane. That's where I like to hang out. And one day, the conditions were just perfect. It was super calm and the temperature was around minus 15. And so the crystals were growing nicely and I was photographing away. And at some point they got really big and they were about 10 millimeters in diameter. And uh, it was kind of magical to watch this. I mean, they it, it just normally they're not nearly that big and you could just see it. Those are like the biggest crystals I'd ever seen. And, uh, and I measured the biggest one, the nicest one. And it, I got a picture on my website. And it's, it was about uh, a little over 10 millimeters from tip to tip. The Guinness record that gets dragged out every Christmas season. <laughs> I mean, it's just, hey, there's the world's largest snowflake was, you know, as big as your head. And, and people just are astounded by this. And they have a picture of a giant snow crystal. But that's not what it was. Um, and what happens is you get these puffballs. And it's pretty uh, common to see puffballs a centimeter in size. And so if you've, got a, if you've got a calm, warm snowfall, you often get these sort of puffballs. And they're fun. I mean, uh, if you go outside and they're falling, and one time this happened to me, we were on, my, I was on vacation with my family and these puffballs started falling, big ones, maybe a centimeter or a little bigger, were falling. And I, I sort of ran indoors and grabbed my wife and kids. And I said, look straight up. You'll know what to do. And they're like looking at me very confused. What? What do you mean? I said, look straight up. You'll know what to do. And so, okay. And they look straight up and the tongue comes out. Because, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just got to catch these things on your tongue. It was so fun. They knew what to do. So it's easy to imagine that these would be much bigger now, the biggest one was, I don't know, like a foot across. That's, that's a stretch. And people wonder whether that's possible or not. It's not impossible, but it would certainly be rare. And you always have to be suspicious of these things that happened 100 years ago and nobody had any pictures, et cetera, et cetera. But I have no reason to doubt it. It was an unusual sighting. Uh, but it always irritated me that, you know, this is the record for the world's largest snowflake, but not the snow crystal. And so I decided they really needed to amend this and have a snow crystal as well. And so I just got on the web and it's like, well, of course they have a website and there's a place you can submit records. And so I submitted mine and, uh, and it was an interesting process. They're very thorough. They would love to have eyewitnesses, but I had no eyewitnesses. And so I had to just convince them that I knew what I was doing. And, uh, and I, I did. And so, uh, so they gave me the, the, the record. What for you is the kind of learning opportunities for this? This is material science and understanding crystal growth. And to me, it was just, this was a problem kind of staring me in the face and nobody else is much working on it. And I've learned something about how crystals grow in make faceted forms and phenomenon called surface pre-melting is very important. And all of this sort of um, comes down to the molecular dynamics of crystal growth. And the chemists are really interested in the molecular dynamics of how uh, atoms and molecules fit, fit together. And so one of the places where this is going is to make uh, what are called um, molecular dynamic simulations of crystal growth. 
sometimes in basic science, you do kind of crazy stuff just for fun. And it ends up, you know, you're turning over rocks that people have not turned over before because they're not useful. And uh, sometimes you find something that ends up being very useful. <laughs> You've spotted the world's largest snow crystal in the wild. You have grown really beautiful snow crystals in the lab. Like, What's your kind of driving force for the next few years? One thing I've been doing recently is triangular snowflakes. Um, this is a, a little odd side venture in that when you go outside and look at falling snow crystals, sometimes they're more triangular than hexagonal. And sometimes they're almost perfect equilateral triangles. That's rare, but that happens. And they were first documented like 150 years ago. And it was a real puzzle to me. I had this theory of just more general terms of how crystals grow. And I decided from the theory that this one spot in parameter space and temperature and humidity would be the most, would be interesting. And sure enough, I got triangular crystals. And so immediately, you know, my brain starts working and now I have a model of how that works. And they only grow when the temperature is very close to minus 14 degrees and the humidity is like 7% super saturation. So that was kind of cool for me because it was just like, here's a thing that people have seen very rarely, but they do see it and it's documented. And, and now I have a model for why it grows. And so that was good. So that's that amazing. Did. That's very cool. So, uh, so I'm continuing to do that. I'm growing crystals at all different temperatures and humidities and just looking for the most interesting spots and trying to apply my model to what's going on. Um, I think more people should go outside when it's snowing just with a little magnifier, you know, a $2 magnifier, and you can see a lot of cool stuff. Okay, Ken, thanks so much for your time. Really nice to speak to you. Really appreciate it.